Project A119. In 1958, Cold War tensions were simmering, and the Soviets appeared to be winning the all-important space race, thanks to their successful launch of Sputnik 1 the previous year. Fearful of a demoralized public in the face of Soviet success, the United States government responded with a program named A Study of Lunar Research Flights, aka Project A119. This project, which remained top secret and highly guarded by the government and military for many years, sought to make a statement, an unprecedented demonstration of power that the world would never forget. The plan was to detonate a nuclear device on the surface of the moon. While bombing the moon would have answered some astrogeological and astronomical questions which puzzled NASA at the time, the main goal was to create an explosion so immense that it could be perceived by the naked human eye all the way from Earth, thereby demonstrating the might of the American nuclear and space programs. Despite the brutal nature of this gesture, precision would be needed. It was essential that the bomb did not detonate inside an existing crater, or else Earth's view of it would be obscured. Some concerns were raised, such as the formation of nuclear fallout on the moon, which would render it uninhabitable should mankind wish to colonize it in the near future. Another potential issue was that the execution of this plan may have led to the widespread militarization of space, further escalating geopolitical tensions. A large enough explosion may even have directed debris toward Earth. Amongst the small team assembled to put the plan into action was a young Carl Sagan, who was tasked with predicting the effects of a nuclear explosion in a low-gravity vacuum. It was decided that a conventional hydrogen bomb would have been too heavy to propel, so a 1.7 kiloton W-25 missile was chosen. The W-25 was to detonate on the shadowed portion of the moon facing Earth, creating a cloud of dust that would catch the sun's light and therefore be visible. Development moved quickly, and the launch was predicted to be ready by the following year. Ultimately, the launch of the W-25 never went ahead, with one statement claiming that, quote, Air Force officials decided its risks outweighed its benefits. NASA and the government instead decided to focus on landing a man on the moon, which they knew would be a more popular accomplishment with the people. Documents pertaining to Project A-119 were revealed following a Freedom of Information request in 1999, but the U.S. government has never formally acknowledged its involvement. A British nuclear historian stated years later that, quote, had they gone ahead, we would never have had the romantic image of Neil Armstrong taking one giant leap for mankind. Shagan Test In the 1960s, the Soviets were using their nuclear technologies in every conceivable way. One example of this was the formation of the Nuclear Explosions for the National Economy Program, which sought to explore the potential for peaceful nuclear explosions. As the Soviet equivalent of the U.S. program Operation Plowshare, the NENE carried out a number of pivotal tests, the first and most infamous of which was the Shagan test. The Shagan test took place at the Semipadalinsk test site in northern Kazakhstan on January 15, 1965. This test involved an underground explosion that yielded the force of 140 kilotons of TNT. The explosion aimed to determine how helpful nuclear detonations could be in moving large quantities of Earth to excavate large portions of land in a relatively short amount of time. The intention was that this approach could be used to create man-made lakes, harbors, and canals. The explosion takes its name from the dry bed of the Shagan River on which it occurred. The Shagan test was a success, creating a crater suitable for a lake with a diameter of 1,339 feet and a depth of 330 feet. The rock surfaces and sand were exposed to temperatures so high that they melted into trinitite, a glass-like substance. Due to the dust and rock released, some of which traveled as far as Japan, global tensions worsened. The U.S. believed that the Soviets violated an agreement preventing the spread of radioactive materials across international borders. Owing to its success, the nuclear explosions for the National Economy Program continued to conduct peaceful nuclear explosion experiments. The Shagan test became the first of a total of 124, but none would match it in terms of scale. The crater, now known as Lake Shagan, 
which has a volume of around 10 million meters cubed, is still radioactive to this day and has earned the name Atomic Lake. Despite this, locals have been known to fish the hazardous waters. Project Plowshare The Soviets were not the only ones who were exploring the potential for peaceful nuclear explosions. The U.S. Project Plowshare detonated 35 devices across 27 individual tests. Project Plowshare would ultimately shed light on many nuclear mysteries and lead to valuable advancements in the areas of rock blasting, seismology, gas pocket manipulation, and the manufacture of rare chemical elements. One example of a detonation project, overseen by Project Plowshare, was known as Project Chariot, which was conceived to create an artificial harbor at Cape Thompson, Alaska. This proposal received support from Edward Teller, the physicist responsible for the hydrogen bomb. The plan was to create a chain of five massive detonations by connecting thermonuclear devices leading inland from the sea, thereby carving out a huge portion of the coast where ships could dock. However, primarily due to a backlash from local Inuits concerned about the radioactive fallout, Project Chariot never went ahead. Regardless, other nuclear tests were carried out in the area, including radioactivity dispersal tests that resulted in materials from a 1962 nuclear explosion at the Nevada test site being secretly deposited at the Chariot site in August 1962. The buried mound of radioactive debris was only discovered by researchers in 1992, and locals now believe it may be responsible for the unusually high rates of cancer in their population. Yet another attempt to use nuclear explosions under Project Plowshare was Project Rulison, which in 1969 aimed to determine whether pockets of natural gases could be liberated through explosive excavation. The Rulison test, which took place in Colorado and involved burying a 40 kiloton nuclear device deep below the ground, actually received approval to proceed. It was a success in the sense that the gas was freed and made accessible. However, the radioactivity from the explosion contaminated the gas, making it unsuitable for use in domestic applications such as heating homes. Although the gas was only slightly radioactive, the public strongly resisted the idea of burning it in their homes. Further plans were shelved. Suez and Panama Canal Alternatives Project Plowshare gave birth to two even more ambitious Earth-moving projects, each requiring hundreds of nuclear bombs. The first of these plans, conceived in the 1960s but not declassified until 1996, sought to provide an alternative for the Suez Canal, which would be controlled by the U.S. rather than Egypt and pass through much of Israel, parallel to the Suez. The Suez Canal is the most direct link between the North Atlantic and Northern Indian Oceans for ships, owing to its advantageous geological position. Before building the Suez, ships were forced to make a perilous and meandering journey around the Cape of Good Hope at the southern tip of Africa. It was established in 1858 and has grown to become one of the most crucial and profitable shipping lanes in the world, with more than 50 massive container ships passing through every single day. For these reasons, the Suez Canal is tightly controlled. An alternative route between Europe and Asia would have been immensely helpful to the U.S. economy, but building it would have been an unrivaled feat of construction, requiring 160 miles of the Negev Desert to be reshaped. The declassified memorandum details the positioning of an incredible 520 nuclear bombs, suggesting that conventional excavation methods would simply be too expensive, and that an alternative to the Suez would, quote, probably contribute greatly to economic development. The memo stated that bombing with a two megaton device for approximately every mile of desert appeared, quote, to be within the range of technological feasibility. The nuclear canal through Israel was, however, never to be. The main reasons for this are believed to be political rather than related to the viability of the plans. The second plan to bomb a waterway through masses of land was called the Panatomic Canal. It would have offered an alternative to the Panama Canal, which simply couldn't sustain ambitious U.S. military and trade shipping plans. It would also create a backup in case the Panama Canal was seized or sabotaged by the Soviets. It was predicted to require between 26 and 764 bombs to complete, a very large margin for error. The explosive power of the weapons 
would be up to a thousand times that of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. A fund containing the necessary $2 billion was secured. Numerous paths were planned by teams of geologists, including one that would have required the temporary relocation of 250,000 people in Costa Rica and Nicaragua. However, as was the case with the Suez alternative, the Panatomic Canal did not come to fruition due to concerns about environmental damage and economic viability. Project Orion In the 1950s and 60s, as scientists grew more confident and creative in their uses for atomic power, a collaboration between the U.S. Air Force, NASA, and DARPA was conceived. It was named Project Orion. Orion's purpose was to determine whether a series of controlled nuclear explosions could be used to propel a starship through space. This fledgling technology was dubbed nuclear pulse propulsion. Early designs proposed that the vehicle would lift off from the ground, but later versions suggested that nuclear propulsion would be better used only once in space. Freeman Dyson, an accomplished British-American theoretical physicist and mathematician, was one of the lead designers of the technology. The system, as he envisioned, would use around four bombs per second, and it would be able to transport 110 tons of weight in addition to eight astronauts. In plain terms, the rocket would deploy bomb after bomb with a propellant disc between each. As each bomb detonated, it would vaporize the disc, acting on a pusher plate at the rear end of the rocket, providing thrust. One estimate suggested that 800 bombs the size of a small car would be required to achieve escape velocity and launch Orion into space at speeds that could accomplish deep space travel. The nuclear propulsion used in the Orion rocket, which would have had to be the size of a skyscraper for logistical reasons, would have offered efficient and effective thrust, as well as superior performance to any alternative before it. Proponents of the project even claimed that it would enable cost-effective interplanetary travel. One of the main reasons that Project Orion was ultimately abandoned was the Partial Test Ban Treaty, which prevented nations from carrying out tests with nuclear devices under certain conditions for fear of fallout. It was the same treaty that the Soviets ultimately violated with the Shagan test years later. Comment a yes or no below. Should the U.S. have nuked the moon? Tell me what you think. And let me know what other space incidents I should explore. Thank you for watching Dark Five. Like and subscribe to continue exploring the greatest mysteries of this world and beyond.